here with you again. This is electromagnetism lesson number six, and we're going to be looking at the basics of DC generators. So about this lesson. So although Michael Faraday discovered the principles of electromagnetic induction way back in 1831, it took another 40 years before a commercially available DC generator was developed. So in this lesson, we're going to describe the operating principles and construction of various types of DC generators. The way we're going to do that is going to work our way through the textbook. So the contents of the textbook is 13.1, the introduction, 13.2, the DC generator operating principles, and 13.3, the actual machine construction. So a DC generator and a DC motor <coughs> have similar construction and are both called DC machines. And sometimes they're even interchangeable. You can operate a DC motor as a DC generator and vice versa. A DC generator simply converts mechanical energy into electrical energy. And the mechanical energy is in the form of a prime mover that rotates the generator shaft. Prime movers include things like diesel or petrol engines, maybe a hydro system, or maybe even a steam turbine. These days, maybe even a gas turbine. The amount of electrical power produced depends on the prime mover and the design of the generator. That is, how they've been built to go together. So here's an example of a DC generator. And you can see in this particular picture, we've got a diesel engine operating a 160 kilowatt DC generator. Now three quarters of what you can see is actually the diesel prime mover. So let me just point that out for you. So all the way from here, I'll just outline it for you. All of this is the actual diesel engine component. So all of that's the diesel engine. You can see it here, the diesel prime mover. There's fuel filters, timing, cooling, ignition systems, all kinds of things that are here to operate the diesel engine. The actual generator itself is actually quite small in comparison to the amount of paraphernalia and bits and pieces you need to operate the diesel. So here's the actual generator part. That's that little part in there. You can see it's cylindrical in shape, but that part there is the actual generator. So the generator makes up a much smaller part often than the prime mover, and that goes for, for whether it's a DC generator or an AC generator. Quite often the prime mover is much larger than the rest of the machine. So how does a DC generator work? Well, we've got a magnetic field rotating inside a set of coiled inductors. And you can see here on my first drawing where my cursor is, got no current because the inductors, or the coils of the inductor should say, are in parallel with the magnetic flux. Then as the magnetic flux rotates around on the next picture, you can see we're cutting the maximum amount of flux across the inductors. Therefore, we're getting the maximum amount of current flow. Then we're rotating another 90 degrees and we're back to parallel. And then we're cutting the maximum amount of flux in the opposite direction. So it's important to see that that's in the opposite direction. So these two here, 
opposite directions to each other. So that's when the maximum is being generated. So that's how a generator works. We simply have a rotating mag that arranged to induce a current in a stationary coil. Therefore we call that the rotor or in DC machines we call it the armature and the coil on the outside of the stationary coil we call the stator. So this particular arrangement produces an alternating current and again you can see the difference between the two meters I've got highlighted. One's got a positive current, the other one's got a negative current. So the current is alternating backwards and forwards. So how do we arrange this electrically? So you can see here a magnetic field rotating and rotating coil. So in this particular case, we've got the magnetic field stationary and we're rotating a coil and we can see some slip rings and some brushes and we can bring that current out through a lamp you can see here. So a rotating coil inside a stationary magnetic field, the coil is connected through to the load by brushes. That's just carbon brushes. They conduct pushing against often brass rings and this also produces an alternating current. So we've got to turn that alternating current back into a direct current so it's always flowing in the same direction. So the basics of our alternator. So as we see in our previous slide two back, at zero degrees rotation, there's no induced voltage at all, therefore no current flow because the conductor is in parallel to the field. On B at 90 degrees, you can see we've got the con current coming towards us here on conductor B and going away from us on conductor A. If we now move down to C, we're back to parallel. There's no current flowing in either direction because we're back in parallel with the magnetic field. Then as we rotate around another 90 degrees to the 270 mark, all of a sudden we've got current flowing towards us in the yellow and away from us in the brown. Therefore, the voltage is alternating as it rotates through the magnetic field. So when a coil rotates in a magnetic field, the voltage induced in the field changes but its polarity in relationship to the magnetic field, obviously. So what we've got to do is we've got to introduce a switch. So we're going to introduce a switch that actually switches the current back the other way. So we've always got our current coming out in one direction, even though it's coming in opposite directions in the magnetic field. And the way we do that is with a thing called a commutator. So here's our commutator. And you can see it's like a split set of rings with a brush on either side. And the effect here is that as the current passes or is induced into our coil in our magnetic field, we also, as it rotates, we're switching the current in the opposite direction. So the commutator switches the coil connections every half turn or every 180 degrees. This causes the load current to always flow in the same direction. So instead of us ending up with a wave that looks like an AC sine wave, instead of this, we end up with this. Because the commutator, that's this gadget here, causes the current to always flow in the same direction and we end up with an effective DC. So how's a machine constructed? A machine has stationary parts built into the frame or the stator and rotary parts 
that's sometimes called the rotor, but in DC machines we call it the armature. Coils are wound on poles, pieces that are attracted to the frame or attached to the frame, you should say. Pole pieces are made from steel laminations and we'll explain why they're made of steel laminations shortly. When supplied with an electric current, the pole pieces become magnetized and just become big electromagnets. Some machines have four or six poles with the coil around each pole piece connected to give the opposite magnetic polarity adjacent to each pole. So here's a nice simple one. This is a basic construction DC machine and the frame pole pieces provide the magnetic field. So straight away here we have the body of the machine which is this part here. Here's the body of the machine or what's often called the stator. End plates down either side of the machine. These are the end plates. Bearings etc. on either end supporting the shaft and on the shaft is the armature. But let's look just inside the frame or the stator for the moment, the bit that's held stationary, hence the name stator. And we have first the pole itself. So here's the pole. And you can see out here a bit clearer picture of the pole. There's the pole made of laminated silicon steel. The laminations help reduce eddy currents. But effectively, we then wrap that with a coil. And you can see here the coils. So we've got one big coil at the top, another big coil at the bottom. And effectively, that will be connected up. So we have a north pole and a south pole. So that's the basic construction for the frame of a machine. The frame poles and pieces provide that magnetic field and we're going to get lots and lots of magnetic flux across here which will, our armature will be cutting and therefore generating DC electricity. The armature itself looks like this and at the top of the picture we've got a armature complete. It too has its own poles wound on the armature and it's hard to see the coils because the coils are in between. These copper wires you can see here, they form the leads to the poles which are embedded windings inside here. This is what the armature looks like naked, so armature and shaft by itself. And then here we have a picture of a commutator. So the commutator is just made up of lots and lots of little cop copper segments and they have mica between the gaps. So every single copper segment is laminated from, or insulated I should say, from each other. And that is that device there. Now it's not exactly the same. This is just a much bigger one to show you what it looks like. So each of the segments of the commutator here are then connected up to the appropriate wire and then they come the windings come back through here and are connected here which then connects to another segment of the commutator. So each of the pole windings inside the armature, a start and a finish of each of the windings are connected to each of the segments of the commutator. So effectively we have multiple windings around each of these areas then connected through to the commutator. And that's what makes up what we call 
the armature. The brushes which then connect the power that's generated back out to the outside world. We can have very large brushes, we can have small brushes, all kinds of uh, brushes, but they're typically pieces of compressed carbon. You can see them here. And they have copper leads embedded in them. Those copper leads just simply embed into the carbon and then connect to the outside world. The, the leads allow the carbon brushes to have a little bit of flexibility as they sit in against the commutator. And then they have a spring-loaded arrangement. Here you can see the springs and the carbon brushes just sit in the slots in here. And the carbon brushes just press down. Sorry, the springs press down on the carbon brushes. So we can see that over here and we can see a very large commutator here and you can see the carbon brushes, lots and lots of them in this particular case, and the what look like bars on the outside here. These are the actual electrical connections to the actual brushes. So brushes can be very big and they can be very small. Here are some much smaller brushes. Again, just a small carbon brush with a single wire to the brush. Much smaller arrangement for the springs. And these brushes simply sit inside here. And you can see the brush is this kind of shape. So it sits against the commutator and the commutator would be sitting in here and the brushes sit against the commutator. So what we're doing is we've got, instead of having just one winding through the field, we've actually got multiple windings rotating through the field now, and that's why we've got multiple commutator segments. So now we've got, you can see two windings here. You can see we've got a brown winding and we've got a yellow winding, which you'll know or note that we've got four segments to our commutator because we have to accommodate four leads that have to come out to the outside world. So because there are two coils rather than a single coil, we get a smoother voltage obtained. So instead of getting this, we're now going to get something that's a little bit smoother and it's going to look more like this going to overlap a little bit. So the result is a DC shape that looks more like this. Because we've got more segments and more coils and we get a smoother DC out of our generator. So there's a thing called lap and wave windings. It's just the way the windings are put onto the armature. The two types of main armature windings are called lap windings and wave windings. A lap winding has the start and end of each coil connected to the adjacent commutator segments. So that's lap. And in a wave winding, the ends of each coil are connected to segments some distance apart. So with a lap winding, well I might just go back a little bit and um, draw it again. So with a lap winding we're going to get waves that are very close together like this. So that's the lap but with our wave, we're going to get this kind of effect. 
where the current never actually quite goes down to zero. So we're going to end up with this more wave kind of effect output. So lap tends to always bring your current, your voltage back to zero each time, where wave tends to create this thing that looks like a wave output. So it's about the output, not necessarily what the windings look like. So here we have a lap winding and you've got things that are connected together in segments. So for lap windings, they're connected together. So if I take number one, let's take segment one, let's ch chase the red wire. So let's go for the red one and it's just being wound through the armature coil and I come back and look right next to each other they are adjacent to each other so that's called lap let's pick up a green one so I'll do it dotted so you can still see the green let's chase the green one through and as we come around Look at that, the green ones now adjacent to each other. And you can do that anywhere you like. So we'll do one more, I'll do a pink one. There's a pink one. Over the top, all the way back. And again, there they are, connected to adjacent segments on our commutator. So there's our commutator segments and they're nicely connected beside each other. So there's this lap is simply connecting so that the coil ends join together. But of course, as the wave is generated or the DC that is generated, it's going to always going to look like this as it switches between segment to segment. And if we want to look at it as a schematic, this is what it's going to look like. We're going to have our commutator in the center and we've got our brushes. This is our brushes here, our plus and our minus brushes and our coils wrapped around the outside. So effectively, they're kind of connected in series. So you've got one connected, coming back down to an adjacent, then connected to the next one, then connected to the next one. So there's kind of this series arrangement as they connect around the commutator, but they're always connected across that adjacent segment. So that's lap windings. So the next one is wave windings. So again, let's chase out one of these. So let's chase out the red one. And if I follow the red one through, he ends up there. Let's chase out the blue one, which was next door. And it doesn't come back. You can see there, they didn't come back to the one next door to them. They came back way down here somewhere. So, quite some distance apart, as you can see here. It's a bit more complex for the winding of the armature. Chase out one more. Let's chase out the, the orange one. And you can see, again, way, way out there. 
So the advantage here is we end up with a, with a energy being generated in this shape. And the result is, if you actually put an oscilloscope on it, it looks like this. It looks like a wave. So that's why it's called wave windings. So let's compare. A wave winding has two parallel paths between the brush connections with each winding effectively in series. This means a larger number of conductors contribute to the output voltage. But because they are in series, output current is less than for a lap wound armature. So we get a better wave shape, but we get less current for the amount of copper we have. Lap windings produce a power and voltage a higher current than a wave winding but you end up with this more bumpy DC output. Both types of armature windings produce the same amount of output power at the end of the day. So that brings us to the end of the basics of DC generators. Hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about wave and lap windings in the armatures of DC machines, that they're made up of electromagnets in the field, it's called the field windings, and that's the outside of the machine, or the stator, and then in the middle we have a thing called the armature, which has a commutator brushes to bring the DC generated out to the real world.